Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Dr. Berkson, I am so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me have an opportunity to share with your community. That's always appreciated. Oh, it's great to have you. You are a, just a bright light and beautiful soul. And I just really, um, you know, I met you only recently, but it was such a pleasure. And then I learned about all your wonderful work. So, you know, we're going to dig into, I think, since you've written 21 books already, I think we're going to just cover the latest one, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of time. So we're going to cover the latest one, which is Sexy Brain. So talk to me about what this book is and, and, and what you have to tell the world about A Sexy Brain. Just a back copy. So I wrote one of the very first books on endocrine disruption, how what our toxic environment is getting into our body and hijacking our hormones or our internet system. And based on that, I was invited to be a scholar at an estrogen think tank at Tulane University. So a lot of my academia background was working with the top scientists of this field. This next book takes that understanding of our toxic environment, sabotaging our optimal health to the next level. And I realized that exposure from the womb to the tomb and the minute we wake up in the morning till we go to bed to all kinds of chemicals, as well as other issues in today's environment like technology and porn, et cetera, and advertising on television, are making it much more difficult for humanity to authentically connect, to juice of really have great authentic connections. And I realized that Mother Nature intended authentic human connections to caretake the brain. When we hang with girlfriends, we make hormones to caretake the brain. When we hug with our kids, we make hormones, they make hormones to caretake our nervous system and brain, and even our appetite hormones. When we make love with our beloved up in the boudoir, we both make hormones. There are studies that show that, which I discuss in Sexy Brain, that caretake the brain, and nature is all about the next generation. So intimacy is not just about reproduction and having kids. It's about caretaking your brain as well as your appetite hormones and a number of things with intimacy so you'll be a healthier, smarter adult and hopefully have a more stable household so your kids, the next generation, will be better. And I discovered that much of this nature-intended benefit of connection is being assaulted by our toxic environment from the obsession that we have with social media to pesticides and in organic food. So I wrote a book about understanding that we were meant to have a sexy brain. It's run by sex steroid hormones, but those hormones are under assault by today's environment. And I give exact steps to protect yourself. And I just launched an online course. And now I understand how much these toxins in our environment really are affecting our appetite hormones and affecting our fat cells. In fact, when I was at Tulane, I worked with a scientist named Bruce Blumberg at, Southern, at UCLA in Southern California. He named something called obesogens, chemicals in our environment that make your fat cells nasty. And they're much harder to get rid of. So it's much harder to lose weight in 2017 than it used to be in 1980s. So I discuss how you can brace yourself and protect yourself while having fun. It's not a very arduous path. I make it fun. And keep yourself sexy and healthy and svelte and happy. And also really learn how to have better human connections as nature intended so your brain will stay healthier longer. I love it. I love it. And I love how you're bringing... Wow, what a masterful thing to bring the environment, you know, and, and our evolution away from, you know, environmental sort of uh, connection uh, to our human connection and how affected we are. And not only that, but in our physiology, physiology and how that's affected uh, by our disconnection with the environment and our disconnection with each other. I mean, that's just really amazing. You know, I, I was invited. If, how this book came about was kind of crazy. 
So I've written 21 books, many of them on hormones. People know that I write hormones. And a urologist and a surgeon were planning on opening 100 erectile dysfunction clinics about four or five years ago. Now they've almost reached their goal. And they called me up and said, we hear that you know how to write hormone books and we want a really cool hormone book on the table in the waiting room for all of these clinics. And whatever urologist is running, that's a doctor of the, you know, down south area, genitalia, we'll have them co-author the book with you. And why don't you do some due diligence? So I dove into the literature, dove into the literature, and I was shocked to realize that sex science had never reached headline news, but there was a plethora of it. And then I started to cogitate on it. And most of my books take about three years, if not longer. They're very, very well thought out books, even though they're entertaining and somewhat poetic, because I like to make them easy, and, you know, easy for you to immediately use, etc. But I was shocked to discover that as I had piles and piles of feet of research in my office and looked at the whole picture, that nature meant for intimacy to help take care of our brain. But in today's world, People, there's studies that show the more social media you are on, often the more perceived loneliness you have. They've done studies on how often Americans are doing it in the millennial and gen, gen, I gen generations, and they're discovering that young kids are doing it less. We have hormonal issues. We have an epidemic of low T, low testosterone in young males. We have an epidemic of menopause symptoms in young teenage girls called polycystic ovarian syndrome. And all of these hormonal imbalances are creating humans that don't connect as well. You know, a lot of young, and I've been in practice 47 years. Women come into my office and they say, often in the privacy of my office, I love my mate, a really great person, but I really wish I never had to have sex. It just really, it's not enjoyable. I just wish I endure it for them. And over the years, the age of those women admitting that has gotten younger and younger. And now I have women in their 20s saying, I belong, they don't want to have intimacy. They just don't care. I belong to a comedy club that I'm very active with, and I'm the oldest person in my comedy club. <laughs> and they're mostly singles in there. There are a lot of single ladies that are very smart because you got to be smart to do comedy. Yeah. And they don't want anything to do with men anymore. They're done. In their 20s and 30s. So I thought, oh my God, I've got to write a book on the meaning of intimacy which is about being healthier congruently inside yourself, which then you release chemicals to caretake yourself. And as I was doing research, which has come out in my new online course, there's the toxic environment is also affecting our own production of hormones that help us have a healthier appetite and healthier insulin levels, which have a lot to do with appetite. So I started to pull all this together with our toxic environment, uh, toxic chemicals, which are called hormone altering chemicals being part of it. But there's also just the way we live today. And I related that to our hormone health. And then I show how you can have better hormone health. You can do a 10 day sex hormone receptor detox, which I've devised over the last few decades based on fireman research that was published on clearing out firemen that are the most exposed group of humans that there are. And I've been able to get people who weren't interested in intimacy from 20 years old to 90 years old back being interested in intimacy. And it changes everything in their life. And usually it results in a much easier time to eat less and exercise more and enjoy your time in this body suit. That's your gift from the universe. It's amazing. So, um, God, there's a lot of things in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the idea that the more self care we have, uh, not only just in our practices of meditation, prayer, you know, different self care habits um, that are that are soothing and calming and and self, you know, uh, accepting. Those self care practices can actually affect our hormone levels and our libido. Is, did you say that? Well, I did say that, but you said it and it's right. You know, Viagra basically releases nitric oxide and oxytocin. Meditation releases oxytocin. And sex and intimacy release oxytocin. 
And oxytocin is one of the hormones that caretakes your brain, but it also signals your entire digestive tract and your gut is the mothership of your health. So every time you make love, you give some release hormones that caretake your gut. Wow. Wow. So you don't need to go running around looking for gut solutions. You just need to have more sex. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're solo, it doesn't have to be sex. It could be intimacy, authentic intimacy. I've, my alma mater is the University of Michigan, and they have a great complementary medicine program. And they have done a number of studies showing that if two lady friends hang out at Starbucks, they release a lot of progesterone, which is another hormone that reduces inflammation in your brain and caretakes your brain and your nervous system. And it's real connection, but not fake connection. In fact, they've now done a lot of studies. They have MRIs where they can look inside your brain and they have people fake orgasm. They have people have real (laughs) orgasm. They have people hug. They measure your blood levels. They know what's going on these days. And you can't fake mother nature. There used to be a commercial like that. Right? It's like margin, margin, yeah. (laughs) It's so and, funny. We're both dating ourselves. Okay, so um, so but but it can, but it can't be. It's not strictly orgasming. It's like 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 with using a you know masturbation tool or something. It's it's literally the connection. It's the intimacy. It's the connection. It's the connection, and it is the release of orgasm. So you do release more hormones when you orgasm, and you release more when you orgasm with someone you care about than you do if you do it by yourself. But in all those situations, you release, for example, oxytocin. Oxytocin is now being used as a nasal spray to reduce portion control. It's been shown in human trials. It's been mainly in males so far, the research, but there's a lot of human research on it. If men spray, most of the, the delivery mode, which is the way you take a hormone in with oxytocin is a spray through the, the nose. And it's over the counter, by the way, on Amazon. Yep. <laughs> so, if you spray oxytocin, the human studies show that within a, before, a half hour before you eat, you have an average reduction of 125 calories of intake at that next meal. Now, nature has you release through human connection oxytocin, and it's one of the ways you caretake your gut, you caretake your portion control. Nature wants you to be intimate. It's not just about having babies. It's not just about dirty sex. It's about caretaking your brain and your body, but we've never looked at hormones or intimacy in that way. This is the very first book that's ever done that. That's beautiful. I'm pretty proud of it. I'm pretty proud of it. It's great stuff and so important. I mean, so, I mean, I, somebody just said to me yesterday, you know, I eat just to feel good. I just want to feel good. That's why I eat. And she, you know, the obvious question is what's wrong with how you feel? Like, why don't you feel good? You know? And so I just think this whole idea of, of healthy, natural ways to, to raise our oxytocin level and to feel good naturally. So we don't have to be trying to get that from the food that we eat or junk food or, you know, highlight foods. And I, and I just think it's so important. Well, you know, it's oxytocin isn't the only hormone. For example, Georgia State University did a study with 11 heterosexual couples in the laboratory. I don't know. They must have a bedroom laboratory with <laughs> masters all kinds of sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they were able to show that when a man and woman made love, when they tested their saliva levels of testosterone before and after making love, they always produced more testosterone. Both? And the night- both men and women wow. make more st- statistically significant, which means beyond chance, their own bodies produce more testosterone from the act of intimacy. The nights that they didn't make love, it wasn't that their levels of testosterone were just maintained, they actually went down. Now, testosterone is, each hormone has a personality. And testosterone makes you feel more stable, more strong. It feeds your muscles. It ups your metabolic rate so you burn more calories pushing a supermarket cart through the grocery store than you did if you had less testosterone. It's inversely related to all-cause mortality in in males and females. The, The more we have a higher normal level, the healthier our heart and the healthier our immune system from all things. So that's one other hormone that intimacy boost, but exercise boosts testosterone. Huh. And eating um, foods that are rich in magnesium boost, which are green leafy vegetables because magnesium is captured sunlight. It's in okay. the center of the chlorophyll molecule. 
So eating the conduit of sunlight, being a human being in touch with the planet, you make more testosterone. So nature, why would nature do that? Because testosterone has a lot to do with us feeling better in our body suit. So we'll be better adults to have better kids. So the race will go on in a better way. So that is all being disrupted by how things are today, but we can get that back if we, knowledge is power. So my books try and make my readers get more buffed <laughs> and be able to have more tools in their tool bag to have a healthier life. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, good for you. This is really important stuff. And it's, um, gosh, it is groundbreaking. And it's, and it's, uh, it, it's very hopeful too, you know, in this world of pharmaceuticals and give me, give me something else to fix this and that and the other, you know, the idea that we can go back to our roots, to nature and to each other for these, these important essential, you know, nutrients for our body is so hopeful. That's a beautiful way of putting it. I really love that way you just put it. You know, I was a captive in my house. I'm in Texas, and we've had a horrible disaster here over the last few weeks. So for three, four days, we were all stuck in our homes because of flash floods, etc. So I was watching TV more than I ever watched TV, and the drug commercials, one drug commercial after another, it just bangs your brain. And the young kids sitting in front of the TV think that that is normal when that's really abnormal. And there's so many other ways that are more hopeful and more fun. Wouldn't it be great if the big O prevents the big A? <laughs> in fact, there's research now. There's, there's coupled research out of the UK that shows that the couples that throughout their marriage make love at least three times a month and they have mutual respect because you can't fool mother nature. So the more you're into it, the bigger the hormones you release, they have better cognition and less Alzheimer's disease. Wow. That's amazing. Now, what about, um, you know, uh, connecting with people, you were talking about the internet and how it makes us disconnected, but what about feeling connected on account of the internet, like Facebook, like people we connect with on Facebook that we normally wouldn't be talking to because we're too busy? That's a great question. So these are a number of studies that have been coming out in peer review literature over the last few years, and people had these very questions. Well, you know, if you've got 5,000 friends on Facebook and you're in the middle of a disaster in Texas and everyone's wishing you well, but people aren't very real on Facebook. They don't ever say how they really feel. They don't seem to want to be negative because they don't want to be be shamed and be politically incorrect. So those aren't real relationships. They're good. It's great if you, you know, people in the internet industry want to have a bigger list. And if you have a smaller list, it's like having a micro penis because you don't have as many people <laughs> to potentially be a consumer. I swear you feel horrible if you don't have a huge <laughs> list, but they're not authentic connections. And the research has shown that if you're on 11 or 12 social platforms and you've got all this connection, more people who have that have reported in surveys for whatever weight you want to give to the surveys, this is published data, that they have more perceived loneliness. And perceived loneliness is a high independent risk factor for all kinds of things. I imagine as much as having difficulty with portion control Absolutely. as with depression, because yep. depression and the way you eat are highly linked, right? Using food as a way to Absolutely. help medicate, right? Loneliness is huge. It's huge. And, and, and actually people surfing the internet late at night is a great time to binge, <laughs> you know? See, so there's that correlation. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be on the internet. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that in real time with real people, you need to look at your life and say, and you know, it's, it's really sad that it, I've met hundreds of thousands of people in my life. I have such a living out loud life. Yet the people you can really depend on for your life, you say it could be on one hand or the other hand and you're a lucky person. But you got to have one or two hands worth of people that you know have your back. Yes. And that gives you. And then the intimacy is really hanging some time with those people. doesn't have to be every single night. doesn't have to be all the time. But, you know, the longevity study was the longest human trial ever run. It began in the early 1900s and the first scientist at the University of California at Irvine that started it in the middle of the study died. They got old and died. And it was inherited by the next set of scientists, and they've gathered 10 million data bits of information 
and they were first looking to see who made great leaders in a country. That's what the study started out, but it ended up being who lives longer and better? What are the factors that make that up? And the factors that made that up, one of the major ones were if you felt seen and part of a community and had authentic connections. Mm, there you go. So even if it's just one person or you go around with a basket of fruit because you feel so isolated and knock on neighbors' doors, I've done that and some neighbors are happy to have you and some aren't, but you ultimately <laughs> make some people who see you and value you. And being valued releases brain protective chemicals. And now we know that that also affects appetite chemicals and hormones. Yeah. So being valued is really important. And it's hard to achieve in today's world because we're viewed on our external, how we look, what money we make, maybe how, maybe how big our list is, you know, yeah. all these <laughs> Well, it's really interesting. Um, lately, you know, um, I've been connecting. I'm so used to connecting with people by email or, or Facebook Messenger. And lately, I've been like, you know what? Like, there's people I have to really get a hold of, and I can't. It's not cutting it to do it through email or messenger because they may not see it for several days. So I have to pick up the phone and call them or I, or I choose to, cause I'm like, you know, this is the slow boat to China. It used to be the quick way to get hold of somebody, but sometimes the quickest way is the way we're not using anymore, which is the phone. And I, there's this, this sense that you need to email or text somebody before you actually pick up the phone and call. Why is that? Why do you have to text somebody ahead of time you, and say, is don't. this now a good That's time? Right I get these texts and I go, oh my God, it's so arduous to connect. So I'm still, I, I, my relationship broke up almost seven years ago. And at my age, I'm on the dating scene and guys only want to connect by text. Yeah. Hi, what's up? Yeah. That's not going to draw me into a deep <laughs> well of connection. And that's not going to release those chemicals in my brain that my physiology is meant to demand. Yeah. So it's very disappointing. I don't, it's great to text with people you already know and to yeah. a certain degree, but I miss the phone. I, I do too. Oh. I do too. And you called me earlier. I loved it. You I called like, you on the phone. <laughs> like, who's calling me from Texas? From Austin. I knew it was an Austin number, but I loved it because I've started doing that too. Like I just, I just push myself to like that little bit of, Oh, I might be bothering somebody. I'm like, screw it. You know, I pick up the phone. I'm like, call them like, and let's, let's talk. And you get things done a lot faster. And, and there's that connection and, and you forget that because otherwise we're just isolated in our own little, you know, computer world. Because you can't, you know, the thing with texting is that you can edit it and it doesn't have soul. Yeah. And it's great to connect with people, but you don't have the lilt to the voice. You don't know about a joke. There's so, and there's not a lot of effort. You could be multitasking while you're texting. True. You have to have your full attention on texting. And usually you don't. Yep. Usually now we try and quadruple task. It isn't just women who multitask anymore, but you're not really giving that person, like my dearest oldest friend is an art therapist and we really are present with each other when we talk. And over the years, we've built this incredible bridge between two souls. And when you really want to build a bridge, you need authentic communication. And that authentic communication releases chemicals that makes you have a sexy brain. You've got to get my new book because it's so unique. And I also have the 10 day sex hormone receptor detox in it, which has been built on decades of research in my practice to help you make your hormones work better. So your appetite hormones and your sense of self and your connections will all work better. Yeah, I just love it. Well, this is a great conversation. And, uh, you know, what are some action steps people can take right now to start feeling better and just, you know, getting back to real connection? I would imagine a good one is picking up the phone and calling somebody you love. That's great. That's a good <laughs> one. <laughs> and a second one that I love to do if, is you can create cameo connections within your own life. So if you're in line in the bathroom after a movie or before a movie, if you're in the line at the Whole Foods or a grocery store, you can start a really amazing conversation, especially with women, because women are more used to connecting, and have a moment, a cameo moment that's authentic. It doesn't even really have to be someone who was your best friend. And that releases, I just had, I was at the post office the other day, 
And this little old lady in front of me was, uh, was walking through and I put my hand to open the door for her. And as we both walked out, she looked back at me and she said, oh, it's, means so much to me that you held open the door. I'm, nobody holds the door open for me anymore. I don't know what's happening in this society. And we started to chat. And she and I had an authentic cameo connection. We ended up hugging each other. We ended up saying, you know, if you want a cup of tea, here's my phone number. We can meet at Starbucks. I'll buy you a cup of chai. And we both released hormones that protected our brain and that made us more congruent in ourselves. So you can seek out rather than just move through your life. And even a smile is connecting. People are not generous with their smiles. Like when I moved to Austin, Part of the reason was it was like Mayberry with skyscrapers. <laughs> Everybody said, hey, hello. And we were all like, <laughs> you'd walk it to your car. Howdy, <laughs> Howdy ma'am. And I loved that. I missed it because I had been raised in Chicago, which is one of the largest cities in the country. I loved it. And as we become more trendy and we have direct flights to Rome and England and Paris, we're losing some of that because that is the way of the world. But you can gain that back yourself if it's your intention. Yeah. Well, and now you've given people a even greater motivation. I mean, it sounds like a good idea, but you know, because we're all kind of into ourselves and thinking about ourselves, we forget to smile. We forget to like, just have a chuckle with somebody who's a stranger, you know, over something we see. And uh, you're reminding us that when we actually do that, we don't just feel better. We actually get better. Exactly. That's well said. And then that makes you more whole. And anything that contributes to your wholeness, when there's food in front of you, you have a relationship with that food in a more whole, from a more whole position. You're more in charge of yourself rather than food being in charge of you because you're more whole. Absolutely. It's the fragmented person that's more or less the victim of the outside elements, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just very simply, when we connect, we d our, it fills our hearts, and then we don't have to fill ourselves with excess food. That's exactly right. So if you can move through your world, it doesn't mean you have to go around everywhere all the time, but I do have an intention to move through my world to see how many connections I can have throughout a day because one, it's fun and I'm a hedonist. <laughs> <laughs> it makes my life more fun. Yeah. I don't, I don't have a relationship right now, so I'm not going home to somebody at night that's doing that with me. Yep. And also I know that it releases caretaking molecules in my brain and it does make me more whole. And I feel like I'm a little emissary of goodwill moving through the world. And if there's somebody that's bad, you know, if you try and give them good and they don't respond, you can just move away. Not everybody's going to want to play. But it, it would be really nice if more people thought of that. You know, when you get older, a lot of people, women complain of being more and more invisible as they get older. And more women gain a lot of weight from 35 years all the way up to 55. There's a huge amount of weight that can come on. And we become more and more isolated, potentially. Yeah. But with balanced hormones and, balance, and intention to have more connections, you can draw someone out of that. I've seen so many people reverse their isolation and behavior in their 80s and 90s by variations on a theme of this. And I've gotten lots of cards from children of patients that are elderly saying, thank you for giving me my mom back. She's back. She's going out now with the pool guy. <laughs> so it's never too late to have more connection in whatever way works for you, but you have to get on top of the number of tools that will help you have that create well, that's, that. and that's a beautiful message is that that you know it, it lies within us we have to take that that action and when we do we will get you know benefits a hundredfold and I just you've really laid that out here today and I just so appreciate you and your message and you know I always ask my guests as we uh, finish up what your deepest hunger is oh what a great question I guess my deepest hunger is to connect authentically with I, some people and that's what's the most satisfying to me. Yeah, I, somehow I'm not surprised by your answer. 
But you know, look at all the effort you put out. It's not easy to do a show. It's a lot of work to do a show. And it isn't like you're making gobs of dough from a show. It's not easy to monetize a show. But you're connecting with so many people because of your book, because of your shows, because of what you do. So you value connection because you're very focused about it. Right. And it's really, it's really, it's a labor of love. And, and I am, I'm probably the greatest beneficiary from, from all the work that I do. So, uh, well, thank you so much for being here. I just adore you. And I, I look forward to more conversations in the future and for everybody tuning in, you now have your action steps, you know, you now know what you can do to feel better right now. So thank you. And God bless you. Thank you so much for having me and bye everybody. May you have The force of the sexy brain. Bye. Amen to that. If you enjoyed this show and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit healyourhunger.com.